What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. <laughs> All right, so here we go. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. Today, I have a guest that is crushing it with her business, Beauty and the Broth. I've got Melissa Bologna on the podcast, a former actress, although I don't know, maybe she still is acting and modeling, um, but spent a fair amount of time in her life uh, working in entertainment as an actress and a model and has made a shift to the world of consumer packaged goods uh, with a really awesome brand called Beauty and the Broth, which is a bone broth company. Um, and so I'm really excited to learn more about that. I really want to get your story, Melissa. Melissa Bologna, welcome to the motherfucking Born or Made podcast. Why, thank you. Happy to be here. That was quite the introduction. Wow. Well, look, I want to give you a quick rundown of what we do here. Really, this is a podcast to, to get your story. Uh, uh, but the Born or Made sort of ethos is... I am very curious, still to this day, almost 100 episodes in, um, to, to meet with really great entrepreneurs, athletes, influential people, people that have impacted lives, um, including my own, um, to discuss this nature-nurture question, whether people think uh, they were born with an inherent slash innate ability to sort of get to where they are at today, or if they were made over time. Um, and I don't want to get there just yet. I don't okay. want you to give me your answer. Yeah. I want to, we, what we do is I get your story. I want to hear it from day one. I want to, I want to understand what it was like being the, the, the child, uh, Melissa Bologna and, oh. and then the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole thing. And then okay. walk all the way through, um, until, until present day. And, and hopefully from that story, not only will it be a fun journey to take our listeners through, but maybe we can extrapolate whether, you know, you were born with this thing or if you were made over time through that story. And then, of course, I'm going to drop in questions. I'm probably going to cut you off a few times and, uh, and we're going to have a fucking blast. So let's kick it off. And why don't you just give us your actual introduction, um, because I'm sure you'll do it better than I can and dive right in. I mean, that was quite the intro, but as you said, my name is Melissa Bologna. Um, yeah, I started off my career in modeling and acting. It was my first love. Um, kept trans transitioning forward on from that. I went to school for international marketing and business at Pace University in New York. So I always said one day, maybe if I was 40, 50, 60, it doesn't matter. I would start a company and it just so happened to be this. Um, so yes, that's my introduction. Awesome. And I, I am now founder and CEO of Beauty and the Broth. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, let's take it back to the early days. Um, what it was like growing up as a kid, what drove you, what motivated you, where you grew up, what was your relationship like with your parents? Um, oh, I want to hear yeah. it all. Oh, Jesus. This we could be a to make therapy this session too. We might need to make this episode uh, two hours uh, just for the, <laughs> the beginning part. Okay, so um, I was born in Greenwich, Connecticut. And when I was about three years old, moved to Rumson, New Jersey, uh, my childhood, uh, I was a very happy kid. Um, so much so that I developed crow's feet as an adult, which bone broth has since cured. Um, but I was a very happy kid, but I would describe my childhood as a complete roller coaster. Um, we moved around a lot, um, lived in many different homes. And then when I was nine years old, my life got shook up a bit. We moved to Lima, Peru to be with um, our father because he went 
uh, had to go live back in Lima, Peru. Um, so then we, I went to mi- uh, part of middle school there. And then my mom really didn't like it there. So she moved back with her three daughters. And she literally moved back to New Jersey with her three daughters. Um, I, I, I could say this proudly now, literally $1,500, three daughters back to Rumson, New Jersey, which is an affluent town. And, you know, it's just only part of the roller coaster. And we moved back there. And all my friends um, that I went to school with a few years prior all moved on because, and they thought like, oh God, Peru, weird. So, you know, I had to eat lunch in the bathroom for a bit. And that's where I think I developed to be funny. And I think I'm funny and maybe you'll see during this podcast. Um, But so then I eventually uh, won people over with my funniness and then developed new friends. Can I stop you for a second, though? I want to. I want to just sort of roll it back a little bit. So you you grew up in Connecticut and you moved to Rumson. And at that point, was your father living with you then, or had did he live with you guys in Rumson? He did. He wasn't home a lot. He was a a lot of the times on business trips. Um, So he uh, was living with us, but he wasn't super present. Got it. So he so he ended up having to go back to Lima, Peru, I'm assuming for some sort of business thing. Um, well, I could be wrong. Maybe that's a little too cry, <laughs> cry um, This will be um, this will be the, the, the sequel. <laughs> really um, getting those details. Well, you know, this is a podcast of that. I, I like I look, I think human beings in general love to listen to stories, right? Like we were conditioned to be uh, great story listeners. We weren't conditioned to be great storytellers necessarily. Sure. And so these podcasts, the, re- the, one, the, the reason why I love podcasting so much is because I get a chance to really tell people's stories with them. And, it, and typically they're, they're really engaging. And so I if, I see, if I see something or, <laughs> yeah. or, or, you know, when I hear like, you know, moved to Lima, Peru at nine years old, I'm like, hmm, let's find out about Lima, Peru and why that happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, you move, yeah, go, yeah, go well, for my, it. My, my father's Peruvian. Um, he never got his American citizenship when he married my mom to prove that he loved her. Um, so yeah, uh, he had to move back to Peru, A, to go into business with his family and B, because he could no longer stay in America. <laughs> Got it. Got it. So you moved to Peru at nine, coming from Rumson, New Jersey. Talk yeah. to us about what that was like. It was very, very different. Um, Peru, at the time I was living there, it's changed a lot now. Very beautiful place. Um, but it was a bit of a culture shock because there's like a, a wall around everything, around the schools, around the homes, around the apartment structures. So it's a little bit of a culture shock coming from where I grew up, where you could physically see people's houses. Um, So that in times was like a little bit depressing. And I went to a public school in New Jersey, and then I was in this uh, all girls private school in Peru being taken to school by an armed bodyguard, Um, couldn't leave my house without an armed bodyguard. So it was a huge culture shock for me, but I'm always been a happy, lucky go kid. And it's same with as an adult, like I love an adventure. I love new experiences. So I was the same way back then, but I think it was a lot uh, for my mom. So an armed guard everywhere you went, is that like normal for Peru or was it, was it your family like had, like had that set up? What was it dangerous? So I, it's a, I, at the time it was a little bit dangerous. Um, I think that, but you know, uh, maybe, you know, if you have some sort of money per, you have a bodyguard, it's not the same price as it is in America. And I do have a family in politics there. So that was also like another layer of, you know, keeping us safe. Got it. All right, we got some of that. We we got some of that action. I like it. I like it. it action, action. You. We want yeah. action. <laughs> there it is. You're warming up. Love it. All right. So you come back to Rumson and you've got like a whole new sort of outlook because 
your friends have sort of clicked up and you're trying to understand where your place is. So take it from there. Um, yes. Um, so, you know, and Rumson, it's not just a town, it's any quote unquote affluent town. You know, they, when the kids are young, they judge you a lot based on like what your parents have. So my older sister, Margot had a particularly tough time because, you know, we went from having, like I said, my life's a roller coaster. Uh, with my family of like having a nice home, not having a nice home, having a nice home. <laughs> and um, so it was particularly tough for Margot being older. Um, and we didn't have what we used to have. Like I said, my mom came back to America with $1,500 and three girls sent my mom divorce, uh, sent my mom, sent my dad divorce papers when we moved back. Um, so, you know, it was like a shock in that way where like, okay, now it's just, technically the four of us my two sisters and my mom and myself Margot's not doing too hot um, Margot's feeling very very affected by this going down a bad path and I'm just trying to like you know get my friends back or somebody in school um, but you know it's moments like these and in, in life where everyone everyone has a story and it, I think I think it really makes you who you are today and like, you know, certain characteristics. So this is definitely a, a moment in my life that really, really shaped me. Um, so yeah, like I would eat lunch in the bathroom. People would think that like I was weird, just, you know, kids in my grade didn't understand where Peru even was. And, um, and then from there, you know, I, I, I swear I developed being funny and I started you know, kind of coming off as like the class clown. So when friends and influence people mm -hmm. and then my eighth grade came around, then went to high school in New and Rumpton, New Jersey as well. And then well, did anything interesting happened in high school, you know, like the little high school drama stories, I guess. And then I went to school in New York. So do you remember, because, you know, I mean, being an entrepreneur, it, you know, I feel like entrepreneurs always have this um, sort of desire to make, do, and create. Um, it's like an un, it's, it's really hard to put a finger on it. Um, why, you know, it, that, that is for me, right? But like, you said that you sort of developed this humor that I'm assuming was something that you developed intentionally to, to win, right? I mean, ultimately yeah. it sounds, it's like, so do you, can, do you think, I mean, was that something that you said, okay, I'm going to work on this or was it just something that came naturally? I think it was something that came naturally. I think my inner psyche was probably a defense mechanism because I needed something, you know? Um, and I, I don't know, have you heard of Landmark? Yeah. So I, I did Landmark not this past G uh, January, the one prior, right before COVID. And something that really resonates with me is they say that people have a quote unquote, these winning formulas. And these winning formulas come from a pivotal moment in your life where you needed that, whatever that was, such as one of mine being humor, um, you needed that to, to grow as a defense mechanism or for some reason. And, you know, to, I, and I, I've had a lot of time to reflect on this. So I reflect that moment in time as one of those uh uh, and actually it gets even more specific. I can name the exact um, event this happened in because not only did I move back, I was like the weirdo from Peru, but you know, in Peru, they're big on rolling their R's. <laughs> and when I lived there, I couldn't do it. So it sounded like I had a speech impediment there. And then when I moved back, not only could I roll my R's, but then I couldn't <laughs> do my R's in English. So then I, I had, I couldn't, like, for instance, I couldn't say the word carry. I would say, I'm going to Kawi or instead of pork, like I would like some pork. Like <laughs> I couldn't say ours. It was so sad. So then I had a speech impediment as well. Wow. Okay. So then I had to go to speech class when I moved back in the school. And, you know, it was um, the same exact class where, you know, 
uh, you know, I had, um, where all different kids would go for different trainings. Like we had some kids with autism in there or certain learning disabilities or mental disabilities or speech impediments. So I would have to like go, you know, every day for, I forget how long to this special place in the school where I had my special speech teacher. And one time when I was in there, there was a fire drill and I was young and dumb and just so embarrassed. I didn't want my friends to know I was in speech class because I just thought that was so, un- sorry, sorry, friends, um, my peers, I should say. Mm-hmm. And then uh, and then the uh, fire alarm went off. So I'm just so painfully embarrassed. Like, oh my God, I hope no one sees me. I hope no one sees me. And I'm in the seventh grade. And then you can't make this up. A huge gust of wind comes. I'm wearing this little jumper. And it knocks my little jumper to the floor. So I'm in like a shirt and like little underwear. And it was, and I oh just gosh. started hysterically <laughs> crying. I was doing everything not to draw attention to myself. Then that happened. And that was the moment I became funny right then and there. <laughs> I'm that was telling it. you, that was it. I know it. Oh my God, that's incredible. So you I had know. some, you had some, some cards stacked against you. Is, is what you're saying when you got back. I and did, you, I did. You like went into action and you started to build what is now um, Melissa Bologna. Like I'm assuming that that is what was the beginning of the v- version two. Absolutely. And at that age, I, t- I was always very entrepreneurial. I would go door to door, knocking on doors to rake leaves, to walk their dogs, Um, I, you know, door to door raising money for the American Heart Association. So I was always very uh, scrappy, if you will. Why do you think that was? Why? What what motivated you to want to knock on doors? Um, I think I think the fact that when we moved back, you know, my mom is a single mom and she got her real estate license and she was really, really working hard. And she was like making it all happen for her and her three girls. And then my older sister, Margo, like I said, started going down like the wrong path. Um, So I think I saw this as a way where I could help out and step up uh, since it was like a huge burden uh, for my mom. And, you know, she was already dealing with a lot uh, with Margo and having to provide for three girls. So I I never actually really thought about why that was. I just thought because I liked it, but I'm sure that had something to do with it. Um, all right. So you go, th- you get through high school and I'm, I'm sure you settle in and you probably are crushing it in high school. Um, and then you move up to New York. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and you move up to New York and you start, did you go to school in New York? Yes. I went to Pace University next to the Brooklyn Bridge. <clears throat> cool. And what was, what was the, what was the sort of plan? Um, I- you know, that's the weird thing. I would run around in New Jersey since I was 12 years old saying, I'm going to be an actress. But I would just say that I didn't actually think I would go do it because I had no family out in California. I, it just seemed like almost like a pipe dream. I had no family in the industry. I was thinking so small, I didn't even think I would see California in my life. Because um, you don't know what you don't know. So I think college kind of opened me up to a much bigger world and going to school in New York City, there's no campus life like your campus is New York City. Uh, So I think that also kind of I think I already kind of grew up fast, not in a bad way, not in a good way. Just, you know, I had to be an adult quicker than others and college experience included. Uh, So you know, I think that experience created a realm of possibility of a much bigger world. And I didn't have a plan. So I started modeling. uh, When I was in school, obviously, I had my major, you know, I would toy with ideas of what I thought I wanted to do. And I I feel bad for people that age, because you think you feel a lot of pressure that you really are expected to know what you want to do. And people to this day still don't know what they want to do. Like I ta- I know people my age that are still figuring it out. So imagine doing that 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, that was kind of my plan just to get a marketing job, continue modeling while I was in school. And then I started doing acting classes. And then in my last year of pace, I actually went to study abroad in Paris. And then that's when a lot of my peers were taking a year or two off to travel 
after they graduated. So I said, you know what, I'm going to take a year or two off to go to LA and try to be an actress. And so I did. <laughs> and how did it go? What was, I mean, what was it like going New York? You know, it's so interesting. So I'm born and raised in New York city. New York city is a very unique place as we all know. Um, and the hard part of New York city, for, as far as I'm concerned, and maybe it's only because I'm from there, uh, like acclimating to new environments from New York, specifically car environments where you have to drive everywhere. Now, I guess you're from New Jersey, so it's a little bit different. But like I, I tried to move to L.A. a few times and I just I had a really hard time. It was just I felt lonely as fuck in L.A. Yeah. Like it was just like, man, like, you know, in New York, you walk outside of your apartment and there's just, you know, you don't have to look hard to find community ever. It's just yeah. everywhere. Um, in LA, it's very different. Like you walk outside of your apartment or your house and it's like the same exact weather every single day, which is nice. You got to give it to them. Like the LA's got the weather thing down. But like, if you're not living in, you know, a few different pockets in Los Angeles, it just feels kind of like it could be anywhere you know? And so yeah. you got to get in your car and you have to find the, the community. And so that was really hard for me. How was it acclimating to LA from living in New York for four years? No, I mean, you're exactly right. LA is hard. Um, well, I love the driving thing being from New Jersey. I love driving. It's to me a freedom, but as far as community, I completely say what you're saying. It literally took me well, for a couple of reasons, um, a blessing and a curse. When I moved out to LA at the time, I had a boyfriend. So he kind of came out with me. So I had like a built in community, which was a blessing and a curse because it's really hard to find out there. And B, you know, if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, like you're kind of, you, you make like less of an effort to do that when you really should do that. So, you know, many years after me living there, when we broke up, um, you know, then I'm like, okay, I'm in LA on my own now. I have to, you know, find friends. And it would, and you know, I would always try, but not like someone that's literally transplanting there by themselves. Um, and it took literally like seven years for me to find community there. And it's not easy. Um, but I always say your vibe attracts your tribe. And, you know, when you put something out there, you'll find like minded people. And, and you do have to put yourself out there. Um, it's not as easy, say, as somewhere as New York. So I do find that incredibly challenging and resonate with what you're saying. Um, but after literally that long of time is when I finally started to like it. Um, I still like it. Um, no place is New York. But I think if you're from California coming to New York, you'd be like, what the hell is this? So, yeah. so yeah, I, I think it depends on the person. But uh, it definitely takes time in L.A. to find your people and there was something else I was going to say about it oh and also it's really far away <laughs> mm -hmm. like the three hour time difference is quite substantial yeah what um what was it like in LA what was so I mean I'm, I'm assuming you're still there right I'm currently in New York City um I I I went between New York and LA a lot and I was full-time LA um right now I'm heavier in New York than LA. Um, now I go to LA maybe a week out of the month or every two months for work. Um, and, and I love it. Now when I go, I just can't get enough and I love it. So it's like the perfect dosing of LA. What, so what, what uh, but your acting career, was that predominantly Los Angeles? Yes, I was there in LA uh, full time during my acting career. How was that? Acting is that talk about a tough industry i mean that is like fuck it, it, it it's such a tough tough industry to break into so how was that experience it was exactly like it was very 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 tough i give all actors so much credit um because you know like right now i'm selling my product if you don't like it ooh, bummer you don't like my product whereas like an actor like you don't like me. And, you know, a lot of insecurity feeds off of it and people take it very, very personally. And, you know, it's this constant sense of, am I good enough? Am I not good enough? And, you know, it's, it's a lot of pressure. And even 
I think it's a mix of being a talented actor. It's a mix of connections. It's a mix of right place, right time. Um, so it's not, it's not a straight line. Like you work hard, you get results. Like, of course, you know, if you work hard, you will get some type of results, but there's just no straight pathway, which is extremely difficult. What was your first acting gig where you were like, I'm feeling pretty good about this? Um, I, I think one of my earlier films called In Stereo, we actually shot it in New York. And I, there was a lot of emotions involved in the role. So I think that when I was there shooting it and I was able to, and I was still fairly new, uh, and I was able to reach down and pull these emotions and execute on screen where I didn't even know that's something I had inside of me. So I think that was one of the moments doing this emotional role that made me feel like, okay, you know, you're only going to get better and you're able to do this. And, and you're not like a lot of these actors who have worked since they're, you know, like six years old on this. Mind you, you know, growing up in New Jersey, my mom would take me to auditions and, you know, I did some sort of classes and drama class, but it, it, there's people that literally, you know, live and breathe this. that have been doing this since they're six. Wow. So you, so you get, you get, a, you get a role and it's, it's a pretty emotional role and you're able to tap into something that you didn't actually knew was inside of you. So I assume that that kind of opened up a door and, and sort of gave you this um, confidence. Do you, yeah. Is that when the whole, is that when everything kind of changed? Um, because the word confidence. So, so it's weird because I am such a different person than I was in my early 20s. And I wish when I was acting like I was this person because I think confidence is something that just comes with age. Like in my early twenties, I was so insecure. Like when I was modeling, oh my God, I feel like want to give my 21 year old self a hug. Like I was so insecure and now I just really don't give a shit. And I, I think mm -hmm. acting and like the rejection and, and obviously there's a bunch of wins and you celebrate every victory. There's wins and losses, like everything. I think um, the wins and the losses, especially the losses have given me confidence. Dig into that for a little. Um, you know, I, when, when you lose or when you don't get parts or when something happens with work where you think you have it, then it gets ripped out from under you. It's really, really grating and it grates away at you and you start questioning yourself. And am I good enough? Am I this, am I that? And just like anything, as it grates away, eventually it stops grating away. And you're just like, what, you know, like, why are you taking this so personally? And you realize it's not you, it's the industry. You're doing the best you can. So it, instead of, you know, eventually as much as you get graded by it, the grading stops. And then you start to just not build a wall. That's not right. Because, you know, I still feel all types of things but you start just not to care and you realize that things are just out of your control and it makes you more confident in who you are I love that thank you You know there's a there's a great book um that I recommend to so many people it's called the four agreements have you ever read that book I have not I'm gonna write it down you gotta read that book because the author really talks about these four things that if we can implement into our lives, and they're pretty simple things, it's, you know, be impeccable with your word. Don't take things personally. And I feel like the don't take things personally is just such, like, if you can walk through life and actually not take things personally, imagine the freedom it's like a superpower it's a superpower yeah like, you know and i also think the impeccable the, be impeccable with your word you know like what you say not what you think but what you say out loud or what you put into the universe you just fucking do like it's that, that i think those two things are so huge but the the, the four agreements is one of my favorite all-time books it's just such a what are the other two agreements <laughs> I'm going to wait. You're going to have to read it. 
to find out the other two agreements. Oh, okay. That's our, that's our deal. That's, that's our, our deal. agreement. That's our agreement. Um, so I want to understand how you went from acting and modeling to bone broth. Okay. So we'll back up to my Jersey life. And when I think the end of, yeah, the end of middle school, the, I, you know what? Oh my God. I'm trying to, there's a lot of aha moments. I had really, really bad digestive issues, but that probably came from like the stress. Wow. Uh, I never realized that till now, but I had really, really bad digestive issues. I was in and out of the hospital. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And I missed so many days of school. I almost got held back, but now I know it's from the stress. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, you know, I was like never one of those diet people. I was just blessed to stay trim and eat whatever I wanted. And obviously that catches up with everyone eventually. Um, but then when I was acting out in California and on set, it, I just started to feel really unwell. It had nothing to do with appearances. I, I just felt unmotivated. I had brain fog. I felt sluggish. And I finally was like, enough's enough. You need to get healthy. So I asked my sister, Michelle, who was living in New York working in finance for help because she got really into health and wellness so she kept trying to get me to have bone broth and at first you know I was like ugh, like I'm not starting off on something called bone broth that's weird and gross <laughs> cut to I tried bone broth and I couldn't believe or first of all the taste is not how I thought it would taste it, you know I love soup it tasted like a soup and and then when I saw what it would do I told you smiley kid crow's feet it got, it, I'm not going to say got rid of and be careful what I say, but it personally helped me with those lines in my face. It cleared my brain fog, which I didn't understand why at the time. Now I do. Um, it helped like the cartilage of my knees from playing sports. And of course it healed my gut and fixed my digestive issues. Um, and I couldn't believe the beauty benefits, like the hair, skin and nails. Uh, so when, you know, I'd grab it hot on the go in New York with my sister, there's quite a few places here for that. And then back in Los Angeles, there wasn't really anywhere to grab it hot on the go. And then that's when I was shocked. And I also see how they eat on set. Like that, you know, sometimes you're shooting at like 4am, 5am and there's what they call crafties with just a bunch of cookies and bread and there's nothing healthy and bone broth also like curbs your appetite. So when I didn't see the model, like it is in New York and LA, that's when I was like, there's a huge opportunity here um, to bring bone broth to LA in a big way that it's not as present uh, in New York. And what that idea has become is bone broth on the go, but at your house where you can bring it anywhere with you on the go. So that's where this idea all came from. I love it. Tell us about bone broth and tell us, you know, you kind of touched on what bone broth can do and how it's helped you, but what are the, the nutritional properties in bone broth and why does it like, why is it so awesome? Sure. So bone broth is really high in natural occurring collagen. And I like to hit the word natural because your gut cannot ingest powder. You can look it up. It's the same, the same way I found it. Um, so the collagen and bone broth, your gut actually absorbs it. And the molecules in bone broth of collagen are smaller than those of face cream. So that's one. And it's very high in protein and amino acids. So if you have poor digestion, your gut develops these holes in it, and then food seeps through and red blood cells go to fight it, and you get sick and inflamed. So bone broth comes in and fills in those holes in your gut. And bone broth has been around since caveman days. And aside from it filling in the holes of your gut, your gut itself is incredibly important. Like the information we're starting to get um, right now, they're doing the gut microbiome project. But something I love to tell people is your gut has over a hundred thousand times more microbes, like living little creatures in your gut than human beings on planet earth. So we are all galaxies and think about it. If you have a poor diet, 85% of your immunity comes from your gut, your personality, literally your personality comes from your gut, from these little evil microbes. 
and bone broth goes in there and regulates your gut. So I, I firmly believe that bone broth is going to be drank like tea and coffee just for this reason alone of the information coming out on the gut. Um, so sorry, I go off on tangents. I want it. some, I want it now. Like I, you know, the truth is, is that I've been hearing about bone broth for a long time. There's a guy who opened up a bone broth spot in New York. I'm sure you know it, Brodo. Yeah. Um, and so I stop by whenever I'm in New York, I stop by, especially when it's colder out and I get a really nice, you know, little cup of bone broth to walk down the street with. Um, but I definitely would love to implement bro bone broth more into my daily life. Um, As I think you it's, I should, and I should be ordering it from beauty and the beast, uh, beauty and the broth. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to, where, where can we find beauty and the broth? Are you selling it online? Yeah, so we're we're online direct to the consumer, thebeautyandthebroth.com, and then we're in, um, we're moving to retail now, uh, strategic retail um, to help us scale. Like we're in the one hotel, South Beach. I'm really proud to say we just got into the offices at Facebook, uh, so all their New York employees will be able to have it. Um, which is huge. And you said on a cold day, no, 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 on a hot day, cold day, scorching day, you brush your teeth, you, you drink water, you drink coffee, you should be drinking bone broth. Sorry to sound like your mom, but I love it. Mine or anyone else's, I just bias to mine because we'll get into the product part in a bit, but um, no bone broth should definitely be a routine. And, you know, people like Brodo made it really popular five years ago and I commend them for, you know, people said five years ago, it was a trend and no, 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 no. It's here to stay. They put, they definitely put bone broth on the map. And I think that the best is yet to come for bone broth or, you know, for the ingestible beauty sector, for the health and wellness sector and for all this information coming out on our guts and where, where people want these ancient remedies now. So do you have a, a, a team that you work with that uh, on this project? Uh, yeah, so I, I started it all by myself, which was one of the most challenging parts, to be honest with you. And then I have a supply chain. Um, so I work with the co-manufacturer, the co-packer, then the third-party logistic. And then on my team, um, you know, we're still a startup. So we have some interns that are amazing, like some of the, some incredible people I work with. Uh, then we have this amazing brand partnership girl. We just took on um, someone for marketing, a more senior um, and then we have a retail woman in Los Angeles. who's also doing a great job sharing our visions, um, to get beauty and the broth into places. Um, like we just got into the Fairmont century city and the earth bars in California. Um, so just to make this readily available, all you need is our recommended eight ounces of hot water and in concentrated format, we cook a lot of the water out of it to make it the strongest, most potent form so that you could add the water, make it customizable to your taste. Cause a lot of problem with the bone broth on the market is you're either too gamey tasting or too weak tasting. And there's also high sodium content. So ours has no salt added to it. And then you control the strength of it. And it's certainly not gamey because we use a lot of, um, you know, high end ingredients like mushrooms, kelp, turmeric, ginger. So I'm very, very proud of our product. It's all the things. <laughs> If I, if I was going to, you know, put my acting on hold for anything, it would be for something that's the best in its category. Uh, so here we are. <laughs> so is it, and what, what sort of protein is it coming so, from? So it, for the beef, we're sourcing it from the strongest, um, like the marrow bones and stuff in the cows. For the chicken, we use ch uh, chicken backbones from Mary's Organic Chicken. And then we use different... Uh, vegetables like we use um you know I obviously mentioned some of them but we also use things like celery and leeks and and just condense so, everything down so it's beef and chicken chicken yes and then we're also launching a vegan skew very soon and that won't contain collagen so vegan skew cannot contain collagen however we're using ingredients that could mimic those benefits like seaweed and um a different version of seaweed called kombu. <laughs> it sounds fucking amazing. I'm so like, like, I remember when we first connected and we were talking about 
CPG because we're, we, I just launched a business in CPG yes. as well. Um, you know, it's just such an exciting category and like, you know, as far as I'm concerned, bone broth has been on the map and, you know, people swear like the bone broth fans are like, this is the ticket. This is the key to longevity. This is the key to gut microbiome health. Um, I just got to get on the wagon. I got to get on it. No. Um, you know, this is coming from someone who was never a categorical healthy person, didn't work out, didn't eat healthy in an acting career. And what I saw bone broth do for me, I made a whole company out of it. Okay. Because I was shocked. I was shocked, shocked, shocked that a quote unquote beverage, food, beverage, whatever you want to call it, could have these healing powers. And that's what the cavemen used, used it for, to heal themselves. It sounds amazing. So I'm going to definitely, we'll have, we'll have a link to uh, uh, the beauty and the broth in the show notes for sure. Um, I know I don't have you for too long. So I just want to ask a few last questions. Um, advice. You went from a pretty um, glamorous sort of, um, I don't want to say superficial, but you went from a, a, a career in entertainment, which is, like you said, incredibly difficult on, on our mindset, right? Because you're constantly going up against, you probably sit at a casting with like 30 other people that resemble you, that look very similar to you do. And like, it could be the tiniest little thing that, you know, doesn't get you the, the job, right? Yep. So you go from this really sort of difficult, but you've been successful in industry to health and wellness and like a very, um, like, it, I don't want to say niche because I don't think bone broth is niche anymore. I think bone broth is actually something that people are very interested in. Um, but you go into this world of CPG which is not as glamorous, um, you know, for people that are, that are changing career, whether it's a similar situation to you or just changing career in general is something that you just went through. Is there any advice that you can give? Yeah, for, for people changing industries or starting a business. Both, you know, somebody who's like literally has, who's been, who's been working within a, a career for, you know, a, a fair amount of time. And, and just says like, all right, I'm ready to do something different. Sure. Well, I think by definition, if someone wants a career change, they're craving something or they're not fulfilled by something in their current career, or they have an idea or something that has just sparked something in them that they're really passionate about. Passions change, right? So my biggest advice is like, if truly think about what's holding you back, uh, you know, a lot of people's answer is money or timing. And the fact is none of that matters. Like we, we have such little time on planet earth, like do what the hell you want. Like don't let things like money or time or timing affect you. Like no matter what happens. So, so you don't make money for a few months. You will always be okay. Like look at my life. It was a freaking roller coaster. My mom moved back from Peru with three girls and like $1,500. She figured it out. Like we'll all figure it out. So don't let stuff hold you back. Like you, our time in this life is so short. Just please go do it. We're in fact, extremely lucky. I've never started a business before. I didn't know anything about USA organic or where to get beef or chicken from, but we, we all have the internet. And this is something that, you know, our ancestors did not have. So we have a huge competitive advantage there. Habits are a big deal for me. Um, a huge deal for me. And I think habits are ultimately what define success and failure or success and learning in people's lives, the decisions that we choose. Um, you know, life is like a string of decisions, right? It's just yep. like all day long, you are, you are making decision after decision after decision, and that's going to take you to where you end up. It's just yep. a string of decisions nonstop. Do you have any habits that you stick to on a consistent basis, like a morning routine or just sort of any habits that you've kind of stuck to that have really helped to shape and change and, and make your life better? I mean, I have this habit every morning. 
of waking up. I'm a big, I have to walk to a coffee shop with my dogs. Like, I don't care if there's a coffee in the house, hotel, Airbnb, wherever I am. I need to walk and get coffee somewhere. I don't know. It just makes me feel good. I like the routine of it. And I don't know if I, if I start my day differently, it just kind of shakes me up a bit. It's definitely a, a nice habit I like. I've never heard that habit before ever. <laughs> and I always ask this question. So, uh, so walking to, so do you think it has to do with the fact that you just sort of like, you know, I, 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 I do find there's something super endearing and cozy about walking to the coffee shop. Like me I, too. <laughs> especially in the winter time too, like in New York, walking down the street in the winter, bundled up to the coffee shop, you get your coffee, walk out. Like there's something really endearing about that, that I love. Yeah. I like to feel like a local, like a townie, you know what I mean? <laughs> With my dogs and I love my dogs and I like for them to, you know, get their morning. Any other, any other sort of um, health, wellness, nutritional habits that you like doing? Um, you know, after my coffee every morning, I have bone broth. Um, some days a smoothie and bone broth. Um, but then I won't have breakfast. Like I'm not a breakfast person. Bone broth is my best breakfast. Um, and then I try to work out, you know, every day, but like anyone, some days I don't, some days I say I'm too busy for it. Everyone's busy. Um, so it's something we should prioritize and not make excuses for, even if it's 10 minutes and I'm guilty of it as well. Um, but working out, I like not just for, you know how I look I, I like it for my mental health um, if I'm having a really bad day I go and I work out because I know I'll feel much better um and I really like baths like baths are really distressing big bath girl bath so do you put like pink do you put like 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 epsom salt in the bath or do you add anything to your bath yeah whatever's around I love bubbles so that's <laughs> I, I I do there's this product it's Gosh, it's like the bougiest uh, bathtub. It creates insane bubbles. It's called it's called like Saki by Fresh. Oh my god, it's like the who's who of bath whatever. I love it. Wow, I'm gonna have to try that. We just actually we're we're almost done with our renovation of our bathroom in our new in our house, and we got this awesome standalone bathtub. I'm really excited. Oh my about. god, you need to get the gift for the house of the sake bath whatever by fresh it's incredible i'm gonna do that melissa this was so much fun i can't thank you enough for taking the time with us what a crazy story um and it definitely had its hills and valleys and you you seem to be crushing um i can't wait to get my hands on some beauty in the broth that's for sure anything yeah. that is going to help rehabilitate me from the inside and potentially add a little beauty to my life right I'm down that's, for like right? I got you know like I got those guys you see that <laughs> that's like that's coming in for I sure uh, we all well it's a sign of you know a smiley individual so I embrace it but you know <laughs> Got it. I'm monitoring them. <laughs> um, all right. I always finish with the last question, which is, do you, Melissa Bologna, believe you were born or made? I think I was made. Made. All right. I think I was made. Okay. I think it's a bit, I think it's a combo of both leaning heavily toward made. You know, I love when people say made, and to be fair, I think it's been 25% made, 25% born, 50% both. Um, that's sort of like how this thing shakes out typically. But yeah. I love made because, you know, I believe that everybody is born with something. Yes, everybody is born with something. And, you know, and I say this almost every episode because I think it's just, it's the truth. Everybody is born with something and the journey in life or our journey should be focused on trying to figure out what that something is as fast as possible so yep. that we can really lean into it. And um, so I love when people say made though, because it gives people that have not necessarily figured out what their why is or what their passion is this, this opportunity to say, Hey, like 
I can, I can go out there and do whatever the fuck I want to do because I genuinely believe people can go out and do whatever it is they want to do. All they've got to do is do it. You know, somebody said something to me once, um, which is some of the best piece of advice I've ever been given. And she was actually a guest on the podcast too. Um, she said, you know, Mike, all it takes is all you've got. And I, Ooh, was I like, like that. Okay. I was like, that's just it, right? Like if Damn. you want something, there's only one way to get, you know, want plus do equals have. That's my experience, right? There's only one way to get from want to have. And that middle piece, that journey of do is not only the most fun and the most painful and the most, uh, you know, like the experience that you get from the do part of want and have is by far and away much more valuable than the have part. Yeah. Right. Because once you have something, you got it. It's true. It's you true. Know? You got it. And like, there are certainly things that I've learned over the years that, you know, take a lot of work in sustaining, of course. But, you know, the doing is, is so, is so important. And so I love the fact that you said, mate, this was so much fun. I really can't wait to try um, Beauty in the Broth. I really, really can. I'm going to, I'm going to, as soon as this is over, I'm going to order it um, on your website and I'm going to get a bunch to the house because I, I love some damn good bone broth. I, I really love do. it. And I'm very excited about your CBG company, the oatmeal creatures of yeah. habit because you're a creature of habit. I'm a creature of habit. And so, yeah, so it. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'll send you an email with some stuff to check out there. Creatures of habit. We launched a couple of days ago. It's like, Oh my it's God, brand this new. is huge. Yep, I need brand to do a new. podcast on you. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Let's go girl. <laughs> yes. Oh, hold on. Same time next week. Flipping the script. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I, uh, again, I appreciate it. And this was, this was such a fun conversation and, um, you know, you're right. You are fucking hilarious. And I think the value <laughs> here, people are really going to appreciate, um, hearing your story and seeing how you have, have, have gone through some intensity as a young kid and moved no idea. You know, continent to continent and back and trying to figure out your way through and then now you're an entrepreneur and you've launched a business and you're trying to you're trying to give people the goods that you got um that helped you come out of some some tough times so i appreciate you i, I can't thank, thank you enough you. and um we gotta hang out soon because you're in here. absolutely i can't wait and i'm so thank you so much for having me on here and a pleasure connecting with you again um, and can't wait to talk more about creatures of habit and all the things. Awesome, Melissa. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.